For the people who will be watching this from home, maybe we can have just a couple of sentences introduction from all of you in the beginning. Sure. I'm Dr. Ann Wagner. I'm a clinical psychologist in Toronto, Canada, and I am an adjunct professor at Ryerson University and the founder of Remedy, a mental health innovation community. And I have been studying the use of couples therapy for PTSD with MDMA and generally speaking um, the combination of treatments that currently exist for the treatment of PTSD with adjuncts like MDMA. Thank you and I'm Eric Tremetten. I'm a clinical psychiatrist working through the Department of Defense and I'm a professor of psychiatry at uh, Leiden University and I'm so-called the quote-unquote ambassador for MDMA-assisted psychotherapy to Europe. I'm Thorsten Passi. I'm a professor of uh, psychiatry and psychotherapy at Hanover Medical School, and I've conducted uh, studies with psychedelics and other altered states of consciousness, as well as feeling-enhancing psychotherapies, as I like to call them, uh, since the mid-1980s. And I'm still in the field, and I'm very much interested in the therapeutic applications of MDMA and LSD and psilocybin. Okay, and then um, an easy warm-up question. Why do you guys find research into psychedelics inspiring? Well, um, there's... It's just so interesting. No, um, but really, why I find it inspiring is because there are such profound and powerful changes that happen in the clients. And so I think that for me is one of the most inspiring things. As at being, you know, a clinician, I work with folks all the time clinically and people can potentially make wonderful change um, either in goals that they have, like, you know, very pragmatic things or in healing parts of themselves, or in changing the way they live their lives. And sometimes that healing can take days, sometimes it takes years, sometimes it never happens. And the fundamental shifts that I can see happening when people are using psychedelics in treatment, um, and particularly you know, for things that oftentimes get really, really stuck, like healing after trauma, is just, feels revolutionary to me and also is, uh, I feel always very privileged to be able to sit in session with folks when they're having these experiences. So being able to witness and help shepherd that experience along is just, you know, it sometimes has an ineffable quality uh, to it. So that's for me why I do this work and I want to be able to help bring that to other people. Well, um, gee, um, I'm not that much interested in psychedelics per se. I mean, I see um, the psychedelics as a, as, a, as a way, as a catalyst to, to a therapeutic process. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in my early career, I was interested in hypnosis. I've had a sort of, a, I spent about 20 or 25 years working in hypnosis. I was, and wh why I was interested in hypnosis because it relates to psychotrauma. And in hypnosis, you, you, you ask people to revisit parts of their conscious mind or their subconscious mind or things that they have forgotten or have forgotten to get access to. And that's what I'm interested in, to give people their lives back. And, and hypnosis was a way that has fascinated me for, 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 for years with the phenomenology and especially the part of hypnosis where it entails dissociation, things that, that you, you weren't able to grab or things that were secrets or things you couldn't talk about. And that's the bridge or the cliffhanger for me with psychedelics. Here we have, a, we have an opportunity. We have this MDMA that, that helps you to get access to part of yourself that you, you've lost or so you had no, no awareness that it was there. It was alienated from yourself. So I, the, the beauty of that is I feel that with this particular psychedelic MDMA, you can, you can contribute to, I'm saying this in a romantic way, I'm aware of that, you give people part of their narrative discourse, their ownership, their embodiment, 
their their autobiography. So so that intrigue. And if it's if it's MDMA, that's fine. If hypnosis, it's fine. If it's something else, that's fine too. And psychedelics. This psychedelic, in part, has an enormous. It's gold. It's it's an enormous opportunity that we have. And I know that it has a whole recreational arm to that, and blah blah blah. And that's what we have to deal with as well. But um, so that's what intrigues me. And you know, I've I've had my life. I'm 57 now. I've had a whole career without psychedelics. It was not part of my discourse. So it was it was left out of the discourse. So I find it intriguing now that oh, since the last in my life in the last three years there has been an added added uh, opportunity uh, in the therapeutic domain that I have to grapple with and that I have to come to terms with. And you know, in my residency, it wasn't there. I I wasn't taught about any of the psychedelics. Well, maybe a little bit about Bastian. So I don't know. That's different from from you guys now. That um, that um, that it is there and is there from the beginning. Yeah. So I'm a little irritated uh, what to say because my life was shaped by the psychedelics, and um, so I had uh, initially some mystical experiences which I was so much irritated by that I had to uh, even go for psychotherapy to integrate these experiences without psychedelics. And uh, later on, uh, because I was searching for the causes as well as the effects of these very deep-reaching experiences, uh, I came across the psychedelics and I had some mystical experiences in connection to psychedelics. And so I made it my way of life, so to say, because I was so fascinated about the topics and I'm interested in psychedelics per se. <laughs> <laughs> I could say, <laughs> um, and um, interestingly enough, at that point of time, there was nobody interested in the university, they were aversive about it, uh, but however, I uh, learned to study medicine, I was a philosopher originally, and I studied medicine to become, it, was, it came like a call from somewhere that I at a certain point realized, okay, it is my deep intuition that I have to go for these substances. It doesn't matter what the outside reality is telling me. And so I changed my way of studying to medicine and was very straightforward. And I always told them, I'm a facult facultative scientist. It means if you leave me to do what I'm interested in, I will be good. Otherwise, I will be out. And I was very lucky that at that point, when I finished my uh, doctorate or my dissertation, uh, that a, a guy uh, showed up as a new department's chief uh, of the psychiatry department at Hanover Medical School, who was quite open about it and said to me, okay, go on for it, because these substances were left for no good reason, and they might have potential, so go for it. And so I had the opportunity to work with these substances as well as on other altered states of consciousness. And um, the, the other thing was my colleagues were telling me, oh, you're a paradise bird, you know, you're a kind of fantasizer and you're talking about shamanism and all these things, and uh, which I did just very little. <laughs> and yeah, but I was discriminated under these kind of level or labeling. And I said to them, uh, you know what, my tradition is kind of 10,000 years old, and yours, 100, 150, 200. I mean, what, what are you, I'm very, very, very conservative. I'm just using substances which I use for 10,000 years. <laughs> Cannabis, uh, opium, uh, uh, mushrooms, peyote, what do you want from me, you know? <laughs> And so I was alienating them somewhat <laughs> instead of being alienated by them. So that was good. And at last, I'm very happy that after all these tens of years where we had really hard fights to go for the matter, even with Rick together quite a bit, uh, that we are at that point right now where everything is uh, turning out that uh, uh, these substances will be used again. But uh, also to close with a word, or word of caution, I think MDMA is so benign as a substance that that will work out, especially with the backing of MAPS, which is also has built it up very seriously and carefully over tens of years. But right now we are also seeing uh, studies with psilocybin and LSD, which might be much more dangerous, and we have to educate the therapists very well, and we have to bring in uh, in regard every kind of safety measure what we could think of to not damage the reputation of these substances again. 
I was going to ask another question, but actually let's continue with the dangers that you brought out. Well, what are the dangers we are talking about? Ooh. Um, so, um, how should I say? So the first is um, you have to screen the patients appropriately so that you don't treat patients which might get you, bring you failures or even dangers. Then first, uh, the, the second thing is you have to prepare a safe environment. This is why I'm saying from our experience in Central Europe, uh, don't give it to people to use in their offices. I think that's dangerous. We don't know about these kind of dangers from the 1960s, not as much because we don't know about it, but we know from the 1980s and 1990s what's happened, especially in Switzerland, that they founded sects, these guys, and so on. So there is a certain danger about that. Um, and the next thing is yet you have to embed these substances in a psychotherapeutic context and not just for a few weeks or months usually with normal patients. These patients are very specific, PTSD and so on. They might profit much from a, a one-time or two-time or three-time treatment, but if it comes to the usual chronic patient uh, out there, then you need more time and you need another frame of psychotherapy surrounding it. And I think you also uh, can avoid a lot of dangers in respect to destabilization, to um, dissociation and flashbacks and these kind of things, which can happen if you have that embedded in a, a psychotherapeutic framework work of a very professional nature, which is, by the way, the old tradition of psycholytic therapy, where we have used lower doses on a more regular basis embedded in a long-term psychotherapy. I think these measures did work very well, even if we didn't ha don't have studies up to now with these low doses um, uh, as much because of uh, the um, paucity of research for quite a long time. Same? Same. Oh, there, there is, I just heard Rick, Rick Dublin have a very good lineup of what the dangers or the risks are. And the ones that stand out for me, if I remember what he said, but I can relate to is, um, uh, the, the, the first one is, um, is, um, um, I'm, just, I'm blocking now, which order I should sort of re revise his thinking, is like um, what we emphasize is this is medication, this is psychotherapy. And what we should caution about, it is the psychotherapy that, that, that needs to be there. And the weight to the psychotherapy needs not to be forgotten. And when we, when we propagate this, it's often MDMA or MDMA or so, and then we forget. And I, I like what, when Rick visited the Netherlands for an interview just a couple of months ago, he said, what we do with this psychotherapy is actually what we do is we, we look at the patient more carefully than in our traditional psychotherapies. Because the therapies are longer, so we spend much more time with the patients, and we really pay much more attention than typically we would do. So we need to not forget the reintegrated capacity of the patient in the MDMA assisted psychotherapy. And, and therefore, we need to have really well-trained people and not just think like what's being done with the ketamine. And I think that there's a big danger in the ketamine. You, know, you throw away the baby with the bathing water and, and then you think that ketamine doesn't work. Well, ketamine induces also a psychedelic state. For, we had a patient with an, just to give you one example, how simple it can be. This patient was depressed for, let's say, the last 10 years or so, and she was in the clinic and she was given ketamine, and she said, after the first couple of minutes after the IV of ketamine, low-dose ketamine, she said, I haven't had this feeling in a, lot of t in a long time. I feel like I'm in heaven. Now, when somebody says that, I feel like I'm in heaven, you should contain that experience for her. So somebody should be there, own this. This is your experience, is there for you. It's very simple, but somebody needs to say, she could also think, I'm crazy that I have that feeling. So, so we need to have that mutual sort of that meaning making is a recipro reciprocity. So you need, you need to have somebody there. And that's kind of my concern. We need to, when we emphasize it, when we do this, we need to, we need to emphasize the psychotherapeutic arm. And we, we use the Mithofer protocol now, which is great. And that's a sort of a sidekick of the caution is like, okay, we have three MDMA sessions and now we hear some rumors. Oh, can we do less? Can we do with two? 
Maybe we can reduce the number of sessions because it's 72 hours. Can we do it less? It's like, wait a minute, we got something that works, so why deconstructing it now? Let's not do that yet. Let's wait. Let's first get the approval. Let's first get the approval, the FDA and the MA, and then do a deconstruction analysis if we can sort of disentangle and blah, blah, blah. So those are two of my main concerns. There may be a couple of others, but... Um, Yeah, I think I'd, I would echo all of the concerns that have been raised. I think the other thing that comes to mind a lot for me with um, some of the use within treatments is also the reduced emphasis I'm seeing in conversation around actually knowing how to treat these other conditions really well, right? So, for example, um, the idea of if you're treating PTSD really knowing a lot about PTSD and um, it, that it's not rocket science, but that an emphasis on the PTSD is also really useful. And so I don't want to take away the idea that we need good understanding of the things that we're working with alongside um, the MDMA or if we're using any other uh, psychedelics and treatment. So there's an emphasis there. Um, I think another yeah, I think another one of the potential pitfalls that I see or concerns that I might have are, um, hmm, I'm trying to think about how best to, to frame this, but that it's going to turn, you know, I, I, you know, I said at the end of my talk, this idea about that I see this as potentially a doorway to greater healing and growth for many people and without psychiatric diagnosis. And at the same time, I have concern about the pitfalls of what that could look like if we broaden out very much so without strong training, without strong supports, and without strong understanding of the benefit and risk of using these different medications. So I think uh, I'm a little concerned that it might go, feel like the Wild West uh, when something becomes legalized and the idea of if we're using, you know, I echo Torsten, that the idea of uh, potentially sending it out into therapist offices without greater infrastructure around the use can, will potentially open the door for more backlash and if things go a little bit awry in different cases, which inevitably it will when we're outside of a context of controlled studies. So I think the, the really thoughtful use, uh, especially as we move into a post-legalization era, is going to be so important that we have this opportunity right now and this potential you know, change in the tides, that this idea that we could squander that opportunity or make poor decisions around it is... is uh, a potential concern of mine. Yeah. There's also a question regarding, this is related to the recreational use of MDMA. In recreational settings, there have been deaths associated with MDMA or ecstasy. And um, the question is, any more caveats from them? But I'm also thinking about, because uh, it's been a change in the, in the recent years regarding uh, the amounts of deaths related to MDMA use recreationally, which is due to the, the potency of, of dissolved MDMA tablets increasing, which of course uh, you could also see um, associated with prohibition, which uh, sort of pushes um, the markets towards stronger drugs, more like uh, potent drugs. Yeah, the, I mean, the vast majority of deaths that have been attributed to MDMA or ecstasy or molly or whatever it's, you know, the uh, substance is being sold as actually has very little to do with MDMA itself. It has to do with everything else. For example, what the drug is cut with, which is in, I mean, in North America and Canada, fentanyl is a, in car fentanyl are huge problems. We have a massive opioid epidemic related to them. And so when we're seeing deaths that are attributed, for example, to MDMA or molly or ecstasy, it's actually people who have had cross-contaminated drugs that are um, overdosing. Additionally, there's other set setting and context factors that can contribute to deaths related to quote unquote MDMA, but that has to do with overheating and dehydration or overhydration in different contexts. So it's 
um, it's far more about all like the idea of thoughtful use of tested drugs is a, a far less risk than I think these other factors would are increasing risk. Yeah, in respect to death uh, cases, uh, they were just seen in uh, dense or recreational settings, usually in crowded populations. And uh, let me just tell you one anecdote. Uh, kind of 20 years ago, might be 25, there were studies going on about the uh, impact on the brain and on neurotransmitters of MDMA and especially higher doses, and they tested that in animals. And so the one research group was coming up and saying, oh, nothing is going on with serotonin as much. You know, the other group said, oh, we find five times more serotonin alteration, what happened? So they phoned up each other, the most simple way, usually it doesn't happen that way, but the scientists were calling up each other and they found that if they put the, uh, the, the rats into cages with, together with others, let's say 10 or 20 together, they got completely different results than the, if they just treated one rat in a cage of where just one animal, animal was in. <clears throat> and so therefore the crowded uh, environment, it's uh, much contributing to that. And meanwhile, we have even human studies which have shown that. And um, the other thing is that a lot of people take more than one pill on an evening and sometimes combined with other drugs. And you, if you really look up the cases, there are just a very, very few which you might think, okay, that was a specifically sensitive person out of 10 millions. So you can't find that like one out of 100, you could kind of try to detect that or so, but you can't because these cases are really rare. And the most of the cases were um, induced by dehydration or by overhydration. Means you have less water on board, but you don't register that. That's a typical effect of MDMA that you don't register. You feel so well that you don't register that you have to drink because you danced so much, you know. And the opposite, when you realize you have to drink something, some people drink too much. They drink four liters in five minutes or something like that. It's true. And then they die from that because of the over dilution and uh, electrolytes are changing in the body and so on. Um, and just to close uh, with the remark that in never in any psychotherapeutic setting, above ground, underground research or whatever, was ever a case where a serious medical complication resulted. Just to be clear about that. With MDMA, sure. With pure MDMA. Yeah, I realize uh, it's a bit uncomfortable also to talk about recreational MDMA in the context of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, but also I see the point in asking those kinds of questions in that there are many people who, for example, are suffering from undiagnosed or even diagnosed uh, PTSD, for example, who are really like uh, lost in how to how to take care of themselves and are trying to look for solutions. And of course, there's many other reasons for people recreationally taking MDMA or, or the classical psychedelics. And in a way, I think, of course, also the more we understand about the effects uh, through the research, um, the more we can also uh, like uh, prevent people from having harms from recreational use. Let me just uh, mention that there is a funny result which was never really uh, taken, uh, take, uh, paid attention to. This was from a German study in recreational users. They got much better in respect to their psychopathology. In the, in the study, you can easily see that in the results, but nobody has paid attention to it. So there might be therapeutic profit from recreational use even. Yeah, and then that study has proven it somewhat. Just to mention that. This question, is there an age limit to giving a person MDMA if the person is in good health? It doesn't specify whether we're talking about an upper or lower limit. But, uh, yeah. So what we've seen in the studies so far is that uh, it's been limited to what's considered an adult. So adult meaning over the age of 18, but no upper age limit. So there's been no upper age limits in any of the uh, studies thus far. Interestingly, so when we go past phase three in these studies, there is something they call phase four studies, and that's after it's legalized. 
And in those studies, they actually has to be tested in adolescents and um, children. And so we're going to have data at some point in the near future on the impact of the use of MDMA and the treatment of PTSD in teens and then in children. So as of right now, we don't have data. I mean, we have, um, there's lots of recreational use in teens as we know, um, but there hasn't been any research data as of yet. I might say something about older people. What we have seen is that as the older the people grow, the, um, they, they have less ease to cope with the after effects. So the, 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 the uh, MDMA has a certain impact on the organism. It kind of exhausts you somewhat, not just because of serotonin, I mean more in general. So the people feel exhausted the next day and this is getting worse if they grow older. And so a lot of people don't prefer that substance anymore in underground settings, for example, because they say, oh, that impacts my body too much and, and I don't want to be exhausted the next day as much. So they like, would like to take uh, more natural psychedelics like LSD or psilocybin because of that. So that might be a present a problem in the future with very much older people. Um, there's a question that has uh, received quite a lot of upvotes. Based on the studies and especially experiences of the patients, does it still seem relevant to separate mental disorders from trauma? Uh, so the way I think about trauma is that we will all experience different variations of traumas in our lifetimes. The extreme, like the extreme types of trauma that might lead to, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, there's some research that shows that over 75% of folks at some point in their lifetime will have that type of traumatic experience. Now, that being said, we know that the vast majority of people don't have PTSD. So what that means is that we're all working with the experiences of trauma at various points in our lives, and we are working through that in various ways, in terms of resiliency, in terms of struggling at different points in time. So I think that the experience of trauma is universal. The experience of mental illness or mental disorder, what have you, is just one end of a spectrum of experience. And so it might, you know, we have classification of diagnosis that pushes us over into a category because we have, happen to have more symptoms or symptomatology at that given time, um, and that might stay around for a while, which would give us a diagnosis of, for example, PTSD or other outcomes from trauma like depression or uh, other types of substance misuse, things like that. But that the idea of trauma equals mental illness or mental disorder, I don't think is accurate. I think it's um, that we're all somewhere on a spectrum at any given time, all coping with various things, including traumas, and at certain points, we might end up over here and therefore have what would we would equate to, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder? Well, it's been my career, post-traumatic stress or the impact of trauma. You know, what this field has struggled with is, um, is the name definition of what is trauma? And you know that we call that the A1 criterion. And then we, so well, if somebody had an A1 criteria and they have symptoms, then they qualify for disorder. And what we do in psychiatry, but not only with, with, with trauma or so, we we label, we, we, we put a box around a set of symptoms and we label them as a diagnostic criteria and they have specific treatments or so. But to stick with the PTSD one is like, okay, if my cat dies, I don't qualify for PTSD if I get nightmares because the cat that dies doesn't meet the A1 criteria. So we say, well, oh, there needs to be a set of criteria before you qualify for PTSD. If you're diagnosed with a life-threatening illness, okay, in DSM-3, you wouldn't qualify for PTSD, but in DSM-5, you would qualify for PTSD. It's like, we, okay, we, we shape these, these different um, criteria in order to label you uh, a diagnosis that then would allow you to be eligible for treatment. For some people, that's really important. If I was in the US and I was a veteran, I wanted to be diagnosed with a disorder in order to, to get treatment. If I don't get the disorder, I wouldn't qualify for treatment. So sometimes it has, has an important value. Um, but like, like, um, like, like what you said, I echo that. Is uh, we're we're all affected. We're very resilient in in a way, but we're also having 
we're exposed to a lot of that the world is I wouldn't say is a negative place. It's it's dangerous place in, in, in a way. It's also a very happy place to be in at the same time. <laughs> so I I'm just I'm just thinking like your question triggered me to, to come up with, with risks and dangerous things and concerns and stuff. And it's like okay, well I'm getting a little bit downer here, but the, 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 there's a lot a lot to, to benefit and to grow and, and to heal and to recover from. And um Yes, um, we're very resilient by default as well. But, um, you know, to, to, just, to just tie on, if I may, since I have the mic or so, what, what we do feel is um, in that resiliency domain is like we, we continuously, and I think even more where we are depending on our iPhones and instrumentations and stuff and more digital in our ways of communication that we wanted to, so then the, the, the young people wanted to have that as well. Who, who are, it's, I know, who are we? Who, who are we in our own self, the self with a capital S? Like, we have multiple selves. I'm a different self when I'm wearing the uniform than I'm not wearing the uniform. We have a different self when we work as an employee than when we're at home. And we want to connect that to our universal self. There is an, an overarching self, right, that we all are. And sometimes we want to know who that really is and we lose ourselves in one or the other. Trauma can have a big impact in, in fragmenting that part of ourselves. And here, psychedelics, with, it, with the S at the end, may offer an opportunity to look at that sort of disembodiment or the ego dissolution and look at who that ego or that self with capital S really is. And that is beautiful, that is refreshing, nurturing, and then you don't have to be diagnosed with a disorder per se, but it, it may really refresh uh, your orientation to the other who you want to be connected with and yourself. Is that poetic? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say anything. It would be very interesting to hear about comparisons between EMDR and MDMA-assisted psychotherapy studies or clinical experiences. I know there hasn't been any direct comparison, but... Uh, Okay, now you're tr triggering me with EMDR. I like... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, who knows what EMDR is? Oh, a lot of people. Who likes EMDR? Okay, well... <laughs> Very few. Very um, few. Okay, there's a lot to say about... E well, what was the question again? <laughs> Uh, comparisons between yeah, the, you know EMDR is great when when EMDR French Shapiro she passed away just a half a year ago and and um, EMDR is great and if you have a single trauma like a trauma with a head and a tail or so and you can focus on the trauma and you give a working task assignment when somebody is retelling their trauma with a high affect after that first therapy somebody could say something without becoming tearful when they're readdressing the trauma. So it has a beautiful load in specifically a single trauma, trauma event. So that's where EMDR has become really big and really famous. What we have done with EMDR, we think that everything is curable with EMDR, even complex trauma with EMDR. And then we overemphasize the value of EMDR and what we see now is sort of a backlash that EMDR is not as effective as we initially thought it was. Especially in veterans, veterans have so many traumatic, traumatic episodes that they cannot focus on one because when they think about one, another comes up and another one comes up and another one comes up. So when the therapist did, then thinks, well, I'm using the protocol, so boom, 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 20 sessions. And the therapist th or the patient thinks, I'm going to stop, so I'm dropping out. So we see, and that result is coming out now, that EMDR is not as effective for some disorders. And we have to be modest. So the indication is really important for EMDR. And you, you, you see how you get me started now with EMDR. The same may happen, we have to be really careful with mdma assisted psychotherapy. Like you asked me that question about DID. Uh, okay, don't overemphasize the value of this treatment. Let's be modest. We know it works, so we need to do that with EMDR and, and the same thing with mdma assisted psychotherapy. Uh, one interesting thing I am hearing a lot about EMDR is a uh, misperception about it, I think, which is coming out, which is that it is uh, not as, I don't know if it's not as intensive or not as difficult as other trauma treatments, trauma-focused treatments. So, for example, people have the misperception that, for example, you don't have to talk about your trauma. And 
part of the, the concept with EMDR is you are going into a traumatic memory, right? You are working with the memory. You may not be vocalizing it, but at the same time, you're, you're engaging in cognitive exercises within that treatment anyway. So I think there's a big misperception that's out there that it's somehow it's less trauma-focused than other treatments and therefore more palatable or safer or more comfortable in some ways, which I think is completely inaccurate. In fact, you know, the, the evidence that we have for EMDR, which is in four particular indications, quite strong, which is great, because we need different treatment options that are available, but how it's being used or talked about, I think is the misperception that's happening there. And when it comes to any like similarities or differences with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, one thing that I'm finding really fascinating within the MDMA sessions themselves is that people, and I alluded to this, that people are automatically recounting their traumatic experiences. And so that's a thing that, generally speaking, is fairly noxious. People don't generally want to do that in therapy without MDMA. If you ask them to talk about their trauma, they're like, ooh, right? Like the avoidance really kicks in at that point. And that's, for example, why people don't like the type of treatment called prolonged exposure, which is going over and over a script of the trauma again and again. Very effective if you get people to do it, but getting people to do it is very hard to do at times. So if you think about with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, that's happening without prompting. And so it's, for example, like the idea I think that people have about EMDR is like, oh, you don't have to talk about it because it gets primed through your memory. But then when the MDMA session's happening, it's happening, but then you're wanting to talk about it anyway, which is generally speaking what we see. So in all six of the cases of within the couple study, people spontaneously started reporting their trauma experiences in the first, tra in first MDMA session, which was like, great. We didn't ask for that, but we're really happy to hear about your, your trauma if you want to share. Mm -hmm. I remember that Rick was talking to, maybe you know Edna Foa? Edna Foa is the... Um, the um, the prolonged exposure. Oh, well, that's that's not EMDR. And the foe is the prolonged exposure. We were, we were talking about what you said that, that the trauma comes by itself. So there's now this this sort of discussion. Okay, do we need do we need to have exposure or non-exposure? So so what what type of exposure do you need to give in the in the intermediate reintegration session? Whereas with MDMA, you don't need to be directed towards exposure. Now there's actually talks with Maps and Redoblin about about how much, but that, that's a little bit off the domain of EMDR, but how much exposure do you need to give or so, or emphasize or direct to in order to have a qualifier for, uh, for um, remission? Um, let me just add, uh, when they were talking about being modest about the treatment success, um, what we know from psychiatric research is that with new treatment methods, the effect sizes go down, 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 down during the next 20 years of the, using that approach. Uh, but what I want to tell you is we ha also have to be modest about explanation how these medications work, I think. Uh, from my uh, extensive experience, I can say that reprocessing the trauma might be part of it. To my eyes, uh, I'm very speculative right now, but it's from clinical evidence and experience. Uh, I think that the main feature of, P or one of the main feature of PTSD is distrust in, inter in the interpersonal world. You know, you're kind of being impacted by the interpersonal world somewhat, by a rapist, by another person doing an accident to you or whatever. So you, and if that is repeated, you are, emotionally abused or something like that, then you might develop distrust, right? And to my eyes, it seems that the brain somewhat gets a cramp in itself and be, because of these traumatic experiences which you can't cope with and so you're developing distrust, you're not able to participate in social learning anymore because you're not trusting anybody, you can't really refer to their experience and build them into your worldview and stuff like that. You get more isolated, uh, the title of Bastian's book, Isolation and, and Liberation, you know. And so to my eyes, the main effect of MDMA is trust boosting and that you open up about others and yourself again. You trust yourself, you trust your body, you trust your emotion, and these kind of things. So if you look at the brain, in my speculative thought, that it is cramped 
somewhat and having more tension than usual. If you put the MDMA in, it kind of relaxes. And if the experience afterwards, you are not going back to war usually, if the experience afterwards it's helping you to stay open, then you get 10% more open with the first session, another 10% with the second, and the third, and the fourth, so on, and then you might get healed by that. And I think that open up about trust, that's the main uh, impactful thing with MDMA therapy, beside the reprocessing of the trauma, which might be part of it. But I have seen patients seriously traumatized having 10 MDMA sessions, nothing about the trauma, but a lot about trust and love and so on, and they were kind of healed. Without reprocessing the trauma, I don't think that it is not important, but I think there, is, there are other important parts of the experience, uh, also related to the body and so on, and relaxation, uh, which are really helpful beyond that. I really want to echo, and the, the two, there are two arms to that, right? The opening up towards yourself, yeah. to your inner trust, right? And to the other, where yeah. you can, and the beauty of that is that, and, and Robin Catherine Harris and others will show that again, that, that's stimulating neurogenesis, mm -hmm. and that's building new trajectories, and new, new if we wanted to yeah. emphasize it from a neuroscience perspective, we need to show that, that new neural connections are being made that not are based on the old trajectory old like going the, no that yeah. you, you go another route which is yeah. which is stimulating sprouting and stimulating new neural connections in a novel way and hopefully we'll be able to demonstrate that and back it up as a validation or justification for the effect that we see it is, uh, it is uh, um, a kind of similar thing is going on with these new approaches using psilocybin in depression that the brain has somewhat uh, being so uh, tense that they can't figure out any other modes of experiences and, and, and going, uh, going uh, together with others and stuff like that. And that might be kind of dynamited away this attitude for a moment and then afterwards That's you are more free to, to trust yourself and the others again and, and the world and God and whatever. <laughs> I also echo that and I think that the, that, I like that analogy of the cramp. Like I often use the analogy of a knot, right? And um, a knot like in a ball of yarn, right? And so uh, the idea that the, the sense you've made and the experiences you've had and the emotions that are related to, for example, the traumatic experience are often what's keeping you stuck in that knot, right? And that the idea of when you have something, like you said, relax, or you've pulled the right string, right? The idea that you've gotten at the thing that like, oh, that's what's been keeping me stuck, be it trust or be it power or control or um, you know, beliefs around intimacy or whatever those things are, that that can help just relax it all, right? So it's it very much like people, you know, that idea that people talk about the trauma, so that's processing some type of memory, but really it's the meaning they make of either that memory or what's happened afterwards that I, I think is what's shifting things a lot. Mm -hmm. Something that I picked up from uh, your last uh, comments was uh, when you mentioned openness. I've been thinking about what happens when there's too much openness, because uh, there's now several studies indicating that psychedelics increase uh, openness, and it's generally talked about as a good thing. But uh, how do we recognize too much openness and what kind of risks related to uh, to the effects of psychedelics might there be in relation to this? So I think there's a couple of things that can happen when there's an extreme amount of, not extreme amount, but a lot of openness that happens afterwards. One is that if you're not integrating the experience, that a contraction can happen, right? Once you're back out into the real world and you're like, whoa, like what, what is this challenging and beautiful place that we're living in, right? And this idea of suddenly those stressors come back in and then there's a contraction away from whatever those learnings were or whatever those wonderful experiences were or those challenging but helpful experiences. So I think that's one potential challenge with openness and then contraction back in. Um, and then... The other thing with openness is that, because actually this links back to the stigma question that someone asked me before. Oh, there we go, I finally made the link back. But um, that the idea that oftentimes if you have are very open afterwards and then you share that openness or you share your experiences with other people who are not positioned to understand what you're talking about, that can be really challenging. And so having uh, the support system, be it with 
you know, close others or your therapist or whatnot to be able to make sense of and work with those experiences is really powerful, but to share it broadly can sometimes, especially when you're feeling sensitive and open afterwards is really, really hard because it may not be validated and you may question it in a different way. So we haven't, uh, in uh, the, all the settings which I have observed, uh, we haven't seen so much problems with that openness, but it has these potentials to be complicated. And But uh, the people are usually able, if they are kind of integrated and not borderline cases or so, uh, that uh, they are able to handle these issues quite well. I don't know about relationship issues as much. Um, and the main problem what we have seen is uh, with serial uh, psycholytic sessions, if the people get more LSD, psilocybin-like substances, and they get that every two weeks or something, then sometimes people can be destabilized and being too open and can't handle their issues anymore. But it's quite a simple deal, then you postpone the session the next, and then they got stabilized again, and then you can go further. Current studies on MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, oh, now the screen went off, uh, have enrolled patients from a large pool of applicants. The subjects have done a lot of effort to get enrolled to the study. How do you see their expectations affecting the results? What do you predict will happen when subjects' expectations are not so high? Yeah, uh, so for our study in particular with the couples, the vast majority were, the reason they enrolled is because they tried they said in their words, everything else. Like this was a last resort for them. So there was high expectation, but also they felt like a lot at stake, this idea that this is, this is it, this is the last resort. Um, I think as we go forward, well, okay. So, and the impact that that potentially had on the study is that um, I, both positive and negative, I think, and this is just speculation here, but the idea that someone putting so much emphasis on something working is potentially problematic because the idea that, you know, that it's suddenly all about the therapy or all about the MDMA or all about the therapists. And so having to really work with that idea of like, you're doing your own healing, right? We're here to help facilitate that. It's, we're not we're not the magic ticket and the, the drug is not the magic ticket. And I think that is so important. People really em like overemphasize the drug itself. It's a, it's, a, it's a door opener to the rest of the work and it's the work that the person is doing. And so really trying to emphasize that, that it's, it's all them, like they're doing it. And this is just another doorway in. So um, I think that being... Now I forgot what the question is. I got really excited about that. It was about the bias. Bias, thank you. So there's that piece. And I think also as we go forward, we're not going to, so we're not going to see people having quite so much buy-in and expectations about the potential of the therapy. Because right now it's getting such good press People really want this. The fact that I'm involved in the research, I mean, every week in my clinical practice, I'm getting emails, phone calls, people trying to get me to have, see them for the therapy and having to say, it's not available yet, or I, you know, I don't work underground because I'm running these trials. So it's, this, it's a real challenge and people are seeing this as the only option. And it's not the only option, it's one of the options. And I think it, it could be a good option when it's available, but it's, uh, we're, we're seeing a huge push of people really wanting access right now. So in the future, I think when there is access and we have more data, it will, people won't necessarily be pushing so hard for it, but it'll be uh, a great thing to have. I'll be curious what it's like, because for example, in our study, we had no dropout. That's unheard of in a clinical trial. I mean, it's only six clients, but still, usually you're seeing at least a third of people dropping out of most treatment trials. So people are invested in this and they're engaged in it. Partly, I think it's the setup. Of we do a very strong and careful setup for the study, but we do that for other clinical trials too. So it's this kind of last resort and I really think this might work expectation that's there. So we'll see how that unfolds over time. You said something about the future and sort of, I don't know, you're tapping into expectations and future. 
when this ever will become mainstream or so, how will that mitigate the motivational readiness or the expectations of the patient? These are desperate patients that we've had or so. They've been calling, 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 and can I be in your study, blah, blah. So when it's, I, I, I don't think it ever will get mainstream in the mainstream mental health way, because you see the infrastructure we have, that's not there in mainstream mental health. So probably we'll have psychedelic clinics which have a different route and that, that, that people are sort of self-selecting themselves already towards the psychedelic clinic. So that whole frame about expectations will be mitigated in a different way. And we have to sort of think about how, how that selects patients in or future patients in or out. But the access, or well, we don't have psychedelic clinics yet in the sort of the main re reimbursable healthcare system, but probably we'll, we'll have them in the future. And it, it'll, it'll, it'll also help patients engage in a different way and select themselves in a different way in a mental health definition. And I think the whole, well, now I'm boasting, the, the, the mental health infrastructure, if you look at these disruptive psychopharmacology papers and the, the whole domain around it, mental health care will have to reorganize itself. So, so your question about expectation in the future, will, it'll, it'll not be the same, and of course it's not gonna be stable, but if you look 20 years ago and, and, and extrapolate to the next 20 years, there'll be massive reforms, also from a reimbursement perspective, also from the individual patient participation perspective, and, and maybe the psychedelics can have a massive input, input in that. Yeah, let me just say uh, three short things. Uh, one is that, um, I've already mentioned the, down -going, uh, the, uh, the downward going effect size of treatments and at first you have competent therapists, competent researchers, enthusiastic about the treatment, the patient is enthusiastic and so on. So that furthers the success of the treatment but 20 years later EMDR is somewhat uh, going to modest effect size. So to say, that one thing. The other thing is that we have been approached by a lot of patients about uh, treating cluster headaches as well as PTSD with MDMA and so on. And we immediately say, no, we don't take you because you are a self-selected sample at last with a lot of impact behind you. You might be especially healthy because of your impact. You might be especially unhealthy because of your impact. We don't know. So MAPS, for example, is telling us, please select the patient from the usual population surrounding the hospital and not you know, from somewhere else who has called up and stuff like that, and it's a very desperate case. And to raise your skepticism somewhat, I might um, um, uh, cite a study which was done uh, as the last, one of the last studies in the US with uh, treating alcoholics with LSD. And so these re researchers said to themselves, okay, we are always confronted with the double blind problem because our subjects always see they have the drug and the therapist is seeing that too. So we, we do a study where we give the, the, uh, the Verum group or the, the treatment group uh, 450 micrograms of LSD and we give the so-called control group 50 micrograms. And what they found is because of the expectation and the surrounding and the environment and the enthusiasm of the therapist, they got exactly the same results in both groups with 400 micrograms less. You know, and then their recommendation in their discussion of the paper was don't use any active placebos anymore. <laughs> Um, there's widespread anecdotal evidence of severe withdrawal or hangover, probably more hangover, from MDMA lasting for days after use. Is there mention of this in the literature? About the therapeutic work? Uh, no, like uh, in general, having like this hangover effect yeah. after MDMA. Yeah. They are reported, but not by subjects in uh, psycholytic therapy. They are mainly reported by recreational users, which have usually not slept for a night and have taken a few doses and so on. And even these kind of data might be somewhat biased because we have done a study at Harvard University together with John Halpern and they have found that there is no Ruby Tuesday, as it is called. But we don't know about these 
kind of things. And uh, what I know from therapeutic work is that some people are especially sensitive to the effects of MDMA in respect to being exhausted afterwards. I would say 10% are especially sensitive to that, so they have to have a day or two for free so that they can recover with that. But usually there are no big after effects in that respect. Yeah, we, uh, in the couple study, we prepped folks that they may have all kinds of modulations in their mood after the MDMA session. So we didn't prime them that the drug could be causing anything. We're just saying you've you're going to be having intense therapeutic experiences. You could be experiencing all kinds of things afterwards. And so, um, and people did, they experienced all kinds of ups and downs and lows and not lows, but we didn't, you know, anecdotally so far, we haven't seen any particular correlation to a low mood dip in those like 48 to 72 hours afterwards, which is what people, you know, rep report recreationally. So, um, it appears not to necessarily be the case in uh, therapeutic administration, but also you're prepping people that they're going to have all kinds of experiences afterwards. So. And good ones, yeah. Um, this is perhaps especially to Anne. Uh, there's a question about, but you, other guys can also answer this. Sometimes it is best to end the difficult relationship instead of trying to continue. Could the effects of MDMA make it harder to end the relationship? Okay, really interesting question. So, um, I love this stuff. Uh, this, uh, okay, so I don't think so. I don't think so because there, the concept of essentially the truth comes out um, during MDMA sessions is very real, right? And so the idea that people are, whatever is truthfully there will emerge in some way. Um, and I know that that might sound quite airy-fairy if you haven't either sat in a session or had your own session or whatnot, but there is the, a truthfulness to that, that people will share what is, what they are feeling and what they're experiencing. And so, um, you know, we, sometimes we'll use the, the term that the medicine is showing you what you really need to know. Your inner, your inner healer or whatever that is, is showing you what's really there. So um, I don't think then that the MDMA experience, if you're doing it in a thoughtful, you know, kind of healing type way with a partner, is going to do anything to your relationship that wouldn't already exist. It may catalyze something. It may catalyze something faster. It may catalyze something sooner. You may not feel ready for whatever that thing is, um, but it won't necessarily be wrong um, of whatever gets catalyzed. Just a brief comment to that, that uh, regarding the truthfulness, that also seems to be very context dependent because we do know from anecdotes that people uh, express having done things after using MDMA in recreational settings that they have regretted afterwards. And I imagine this rarely happens. I've never heard of it happening in a therapeutic setting. Yeah, this highlights the importance of your set, your setting and your context for how, why, when, where and with whom you are using a psychedelic or an intactogen. So yeah, in a context where there's all kinds of stimuli, it's not contained, you're not doing it with a set intention or purpose or a ceremony or whatever, all kinds of things are gonna happen and all kinds of actions and decisions and emotions and reactions are gonna be there. In a contained context, that's when we would say that the truth would emerge, right? It's because you're containing all those other variables so you get to be in that moment and experiencing that fully. That's the difference. I completely agree with you, um, but just want to share an anecdote about a friend in the late 1980s. Uh, he had two MDMA pills in his fridge, and his girlfriend was telling he never took MDMA. He did it two times before or something, and uh, he uh, she was eager to separate from him. So he thought by himself, okay, I will kind of manipulate her by giving her an MDMA pill and then she will stay with me, right? Because she fell in love and stuff because it's a kind of romantic love feeling too. So what happened is they did the drug together and talked without anxiety about separating. 
So it's exactly what, <laughs> what came out, what was real, it was so funny. You know, they had no problem with the separation afterwards. <laughs> I mean, that was that. This really interesting question that you don't regularly hear here in a panel. Why the most popular question is not asked? And uh, what is that? I will reply to that. Uh, the most popular question here is not asked because it's such a big question. And I'm thinking of the sort of story arc of this panel discussion. So I didn't want to ask the, the most popular question in the beginning. But now that we're warmed up a bit, it's a bit challenging one. Uh, a straightforward question, but challenging. Is psychotherapy with psychedelics going to be able to address effectively the spiritual problem of our age? The wish problem? The spiritual problem. It's uh, yeah. Yeah. challenging well, the, question, the question is too big for me. <laughs> Do we have an answer? Or? <laughs> well, you take I'll, it I'll take a stab at this one. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So, hmm. I think I think it's giving us an opportunity to shed more light on the spiritual experience. I think also because we have a, a big turning away from the spiritual and a lot of that in different contexts in different places has happened as a result of um, either uh, a pushback against religiosity of uh, dogmatism. I think those are different things that have occurred or entrenchment in those things as well. Um, depending on the context and the person and the situation. So, interestingly, as someone who was trained in a cognitive behavioral model, you know, I trained in protocols and all that, and then got introduced, well, I always had my like, okay, this has its time and place, cool. And there's a lot more as well. That um, for me, the ex I'll go into some personal sharing around this, which is interesting because we just joked that we thought that that question would probably be about sharing about our psychedelic experiences, but it wasn't that question. Um, but for me, on the path of doing this research and doing this work has fundamentally shaped how I think and uh, do this work and also have questions and conversations about spirituality in a much different way. And so... In a sense, the medicine is working on me in terms of how I'm literally doing the work and having conversations and spreading information about it. So in that way, I think it really can shape how each of us individually and collectively are thinking about the spiritual and also the fact that you know, MDMA is just one of a group of uh, substances that have been used for millennia, right? As Torsten said, that you know, this is part of a rich tradition of different ways of working with the spiritual, with the transcendent, with er ways of ritual and experience that we have moved very far away from in many contexts and are now seeing a movement back towards in different ways. And I think that's an opportunity um, and one way in which, you know, you see when people are engaging in those ways of working with the world and working with the universe, that there can be an openness that occurs and, and community created that can be working towards the common good. So I think that it, it lends an opportunity and lends a potentially a pathway to conversation or thinking that might open people up in different ways towards the spiritual or transcendent in different capacities that might look very different for each person. So. A brief follow-up before uh, handing over the mic and you guys can also answer this because this is not uh, directly about psychedelics, but this is about spirituality, which is a concept that often comes up when you are working with psychedelics. So can you also give your most like down-to-earth practical definition of what spirituality could mean? Oh. What are we actually talking about? Because people talk about spiritual effects and the question was about the, the question was about the spiritual challenge of our time. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> We're gonna need some support and integration on this one. No, um, it, the okay. So, how I've wrestled with the idea of spirituality um, is this idea of an understanding of self, world, consciousness, and potentially whatever is connecting us all. 
And that can be, a, for various people and their understandings, can be things from the universe to the cosmos to God to different deities to creator to you name it. Um, that there, there isn't a singular definition of that, and it isn't tied to a religiosity that is, you know, following one path that, you know, chose a particular way of exercising a spirituality. So for my personal definition of it is this encompassing of these different layers that all go together and that there's a larger um, general idea that encompasses it all. And I've had a, a shifting and changing experience with that and, and what that means. The fact that I would even say the word the universe or the divine or the cosmos in front of an audience where I just gave an academic talk, I'm like, what? Um, but, I, but it's powerful and meaningful um, for me and for, I think, I hope you. And also the idea that those, these things aren't, um, that, that's a, some of the ineffableness or the power behind using some of these tools, these MDMA or any other psychedelic is that it opens people up to at least entertaining I different ideas and working with different ways that can bring um, collective good. Yeah. I don't know if I well, the, some words pop up is um, is um, um, the, the word awe is sort of um, like uh, humility uh, of of something bigger. And that bigger can be something which is like the cosmos, but it could also be what you sometimes hear, and I can refer to an own experience, a religious experience, which is also sacred and is also spiritual and is very personal for, I'm, I'm raised in a Catholic tradition and, and, um, and, and Catholicism as a religion, but you have different religions. Like when you have an ego dissolution experience that can be very, very like like a like an experience that has an enormous religious connotation where if you feel you're die and you don't you're not sad that you're dying and that's another 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 state of being and that you can look down at the people and the earth that are crying about you but you you're not sad that they're crying for you because there's no necessity because you're going to go back to finish your life that is a, a sort of a spiritually, spirituality or so. It has a, it has a meaning-making incentive for you to have a, another definition of yourself when you go back to the world. And um, it's what it reminds me and some people that I talk to all is, is the awe. It's the connectedness to the world and to have a purpose in the world, to do good to others, to have a contribution to the world and to save plastic from the ocean, or to be nice to each other, and not to make war, but to kind of make peace. And, and if, I, I feel that, that if for future generations or so, or so we've, we've, maybe we need to, we need to yeah, there's a sort of preservation of the planet also, the, the ecological kind of climate. We need to preserve the earth, but we need to, I feel that if we, when I talk to Rick, he's very, very incentivizing about this as well, and, and other people in MAPS have this sort of collective, collective like, not only be nice to each other, but be nice to our environment, clean up. Like, I was at Burning Man just, just a couple of weeks ago, which is a, thank you. <laughs> go there. It's a beautiful idea. You go to Burning Man, it's, 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 it's the desert when you go there, but everybody cleans up their shit. At the end, it's a desert again. And it's sort, of, it's sort of, we take care of each other, but we also conserve the planet. Does that have to do with the psychedelics and stuff? It, well, it increases, probably, it contributes to the experience that we need to do something to conserve. And, and the humility, the, that biggerness or so, and if it's a divine God feeling or Jesus or whoever it is, that can be very personal, that contributes to that state of mind that motivates you to... to to contribute in a, in, a, in a good way to your life. And then when you lose or when you die, then it's gonna be okay, you don't have to sad, be sad about it. So I feel that um, that is sort of a couple of words that I wanna to convey to my spirituality. And I, 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 have, I wake up every morning and I feel very energized when I reflect, when I close my eyes. And, and you know, one, one moment, because we were about sharing our experiences and when it's, it's still one 
snapshot of my psychedelic experience when I was having my MDMA. You know, if I, I'm very hypnotizable, I said that, but when I close my eyes and I reflect on my MDMA session, I can get that same contact high without MDMA. I don't need to take my MDMA to have that same feeling of when I look in the other person's eye, I feel connected in a way that I didn't feel before. Is that MDMA? I'm not high on MDMA, but it's, it's sort of, it's, it's also in my neural network. So, I get energized by that. That's my spiritual high. Yeah, I uh, want to first mention, if I try to answer the question somewhat, uh, that uh, there are very uh, serious and fundamental reasons to be skeptic about the impact of religion on the history of humanity. Um, there are some good sides, but there are also some bad sides. We have to realize that. And it seems that in the U.S., uh, the people were going away from dogmatic re religiosity and called themselves spiritual. So that's a kind of more neutral term or something like that. So what is astonishing for me personally is that after I started in 1980 to uh, search for what is a mystical experience is and what it can uh, bring to humanity or whatever, uh, and I studied the whole thing, then nobody was on that track. Right now, we are thinking about making the main healing ingredient against depression the mystical experience. I mean, how is that? That's a revolution in psychiatry. It, was, it gives me goose, goose, goose pumples on my skin when, I, when I'm talking to you about that. It's really unbelievable. And therefore, there is a certain thing that mystical experience, I don't talk about spirituality and all these kind of implications, but mystical experience is a very basic experience. It has been distributed worldwide always because of the repressive attitude in our culture about ecstatic experiences in general, especially mystical experience, we have kind of suppressed it. We know from surveys that kind of 50% of people being 40 years and older have had the mystic experience, but usually they completely suppress these things. I had one subject in my psilocybin study at Hanover Medical School, a doctor, and he, three weeks later, he had the kind of mystic experience. Three weeks later, he came to my office and said, Torsten, do you know what? I had had such an experience kind of 15 years ago. It was two days where I was completely outside of myself. I hugged the trees and I was really going crazy, but I never talked to anybody about that because they might think I'm crazy and he's definitely not crazy, you know? Um, the other thing is what might be important is to to, um, to, kind of, um, to kind of lose your egocentric perspective. Because capitalism and the last hundred years of industrialization have made us completely egotistic, a little less so in the former socialist countries. They are more under collectives and the Chinese people and so on. But otherwise, we tend to be more and more and more so. You know? And I think that could be a kind of correction kind of mechanism of bringing us away from too much egocentricity, so to say. And in consequence, and this is definitely what I got out of my, all my experience, is what we are not thinking of is the other species. We have done the greatest mass extinction on the planet in respect to diversity. You know, that's the real problem. We are the problem. We are much too much. You know, and I think that's really important because if you are really egoless, it means you see the other species and their own rights to survive, to live, to unfold. You know, even we have so much animal rights organization. What's about plants' rights? Yeah, we, we plant, Pflanzenschutzmittel is a German term for for the, all these poisons, what they spray on the plants. You know, nobody is caring about these organisms. That's the main thing. We need to reduce us in our egocentricity and in our population size. I was reminded, uh, when Eric mentioned the word sacred, I heard a very good definition recently from uh, the Canadian uh, cognitive scientist, Paul, uh, sorry, John Verveke, who said that uh, sacred is 
something that we keep coming back to in order to regenerate ourselves. And I think that's a pretty good uh, down-to-earth description of that. I would like to know if there's any use of MDMA uh, with regard to uh, drug withdrawal, prescription drugs, I mean, for example, SSRIs. Because there's this huge problem of long-term SSRI yep. use, and people are having serious withdrawal problems. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I haven't discovered anything that would help, apart from, you know, of course, no kind of mental uh, policy. So, is any research done? No, so I'll, re I'll repeat, uh, or you, you can also repeat the question for the recording. It, yeah, it was about uh, SSRI antidepressant treatment in the long term. Yeah. Then you have quite a bit of dependency with most of the patients, not all of them, but most of the patients, they become dependent. It wasn't uh, made clear by the pharmaceutical companies. I know why, but... And, and now we have that problem. Uh, there are no studies out there. What is recently communicated in the psychedelic community is that microdoses of LSD and psilocybin might be helpful with that condition, but there are no, there's no proof about that. Otherwise, you just can dump down it quite mildly, bit by bit. And for example, with citalopram, a major SSRI, there are, uh, there are liquids out there right now so in a drop form, so that you can really uh, dump it down milligram by milligram and you don't have these five milligram or 10 milligram pills. But otherwise there's nothing out there. I don't know if you know. No, no. It's, it's an error by the pharmaceutical industry that they need these tablets, but they don't make the dosages that can taper you off. Yeah, yeah, yeah easy. The pro problem in Finland is that they, they, you know, the medical profession denies the, the, those problems. They, mm -hmm. Patients are, they are not heard. Oh, well, uh, no. and they are dismissed and yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the peer support community with, is the only option. With some support. patients it matters really, they're sensitive, so you have to, well, that's my excuse, you have to titrate those. And then yeah. you feel like, well, it's sub-threshold, but it matters because their system may be so sensitive that even even though if they go for mirt mirtazapine from, from, yeah. from low dose to lower dose, you have to sort of mitigate that really careful. Yeah. Yeah. This, this well is the advice we give, we give in our peer support group, but I was interested okay. in, in hearing if any MDA yeah. or MDA and AO or anything has been used. And uh, it's important to realize that quite a bit of the so-called psychedelic renaissance has to do with serious research, sponsored mainly by Rick and his enthusiasm and uh, donors, which he activated. But it's also, the, uh, the rise of the psychedelics, again, is also induced by the, uh, the inefficacy and dangers of the usual psychopharmacological drugs. The neuroleptics taken in the long run on a daily basis are kind of detrimental, as well as the SSRIs, and you might know that all these new meta-analyses of the data, of the real data sets have shown that the significance or the, the difference between the SSRIs and the placebo condition is virtually nothing. And so they are very ineffective, but produce a lot of side effects and have the, also this dependence potential and so on. So this is why the pharmaceutical industry, I think it was mentioned, is out of business for more than 10 years in respect to psycho developing uh, psychopharmacological medications. And this is also why psychedelics are on the rise again, because there's nothing there. And now we are going back to the real thing, to my eyes. So maybe two more questions. Some people, um, well, these, these are uh, uh, questions that are asked by the audience. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's just that some questions might build up during the conversation. Yeah, they, they are. They are building. They are yeah, yeah, yeah. Their yeah, they're real-time questions. Okay, okay. People are constantly. Yeah, yeah. They're constantly. I wasn't writing. realizing that. So. Yeah, maybe we should have uh, made that more clear. Sure. So they, yeah, they, they were not written by me. <laughs> <laughs> some of them maybe were. Uh, some Very much updated though. <laughs> uh, some people expect psychedelics. Um, some people expect psychedelics will reduce the necessary uh, amount of training of therapists, therefore increasing availability of the treatment. Any thoughts? So that they will reduce the necessary amount of training of therapists. Decrease? Yeah. yeah. They will increase the necessary amount. Who, who, has, who is asking that question? Could you, could you, what do you mean? I have heard opinions that uh, using psychedelics makes uh, therapy easier. 
So with less training, you yeah. could provide yeah. it. Yeah, that, that could yeah that could be a problem. I, I already mentioned that Maps has taken much care in the long process of establishing appropriate therapeutic uh, uh, education for the therapist or training, but uh, with other substances which are on the run right now in respect to trials, uh, they have just one experience with the drug and a very few little bits surrounding it. And so therefore you, your question is definitely in place. The more dangerous the substances potential might be, the, uh, the better the therapist education should be. And it's not making therapy easier. In some cases with couples, for example, which stabilize it in their diets might be, uh, that might be not as dangerous, but with other substances and in individual settings and groups as well, uh, there might be uh, problems, especially if the therapists are not well educated. And in the 1960s, there was a saying which said, if you are a bad therapist, use these substances, then you might be a better one. You know, but it's not use it on the, yourselves. It's more like it's a thing well, you have already emphasized the, the problem that the people focus too much on the drug or too much on the therapy. This is a combination of both. And it's, the, the training of the therapist is a very important question to my eyes. And we definitely have to develop certification processes and appropriate curricula, what we already, already have begun to develop. That's what we're thinking of. We have a group in the Netherlands uh, that actually looking at, at that curriculum. And like we have MDMA assisted psychotherapy, but should we have a curriculum where we focus on the different psychedelic compounds? And then, and also is like, okay, does the therapist need to be engaged or, or have experience in several series of psy psilocybin trials to have a better you know, understanding of, of the sequential administration of these drugs? And is that necessary or not? And, and when are you a psychedelic therapist? And how many disorders or so? Or what range of disorders that can you then treat? We're sort of trying to, to get our heads around that. And like, like th there's going to be ketamine on the market. There's going to be psilocybin for depression. So in, I'm a psilocybin depression therapist. I'm an MDMA PTSD therapist. So we need to sort of umbrella that. And we need to give a package or so. But we haven't had completely our heads around that. But, it's in the mix, for sure, and their curricula being built, and, and yeah, we're working on that. So we are with MAPS and also within, you know, we have a consortium to be built in the Netherlands because we're doing at several academic centers, so we're sort of trying to co-allied with a couple of academic centers and also internationalize with, uh, with people who have expertise and also a desire for the generation to come to train them and to provide them uh, these, these training packages. I have high hopes and good hopes that it will be there. I was really anxious to answer this question. Clearly, I've been like, oh, with the microphone. But um, I think this is a big question and a big concern I have, especially because people are seeing it from the trip-sitting model, right? So that the idea, uh, especially that we see, for example, at festivals and in different harm reduction spaces of people with some training, not a ton, doing trip sitting. That's really, really different than doing psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And so I want to really emphasize that. You know, if you've sat for someone in a zendo or in a sanctuary, that is different than doing psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Because what you're doing in those spaces is you are helping someone through that experience that they've had, that they're maybe having a challenging experience in, or they need a safe place. There are some similar skill sets that are being applied, but it's not the same thing. And in fact, in those spaces, you're not supposed to be doing psychotherapy. You're just, you're helping, you're sitting with. And so um, some of the things that I find problematic of things that are emerging now and actually building off that idea of this capitalist system that's coming into play is we're starting to see these upticks in groups that are trying to offer retreats or group sessions in places where it's legal, right, to, for example, offer, offer truffles, retreats, and things like that. And in those contexts, they have sitters and those experiences who are not therapists. And so to me, that's very problematic if someone, if, for example, is reading this research and then is going on these retreats and is trying to heal something, and then they're doing that work without a therapist with them or without the, the situation. And you know, I've, I've even heard um, some some of the entrepreneurs who are talking about this, and they you know they have visions of doing these things, and they say, oh well, the plant is going to do all the work itself. And it's like, whoa, 
whole, no. And, you know, it, for example, if you're going to an ayahuasca retreat in, run by a shaman in the Amazon, they have oodles of training in being a shaman, right? Like they know how to work with those experiences. So we should not be assuming that because someone has had a, a strong spiritual experience for themselves that they, on a different a substance, that they can be an effective psychedelic psychotherapist, right? It's a different thing altogether. Uh, probably the final question. We are now seeing an increase in research and knowledge in usage of psychedelics with trauma therapy. However, someone once said to me that the best time to go to therapy is when you're feeling healthy. Do you see a world where we could use these tools not just as an acute remedy, but as a part of normal life? Could taking psychedelics be seen just as normal and spiritual self-healing activity as going to church is? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> And that's, you know, part of what I was aiming at and hoping to open the door to with the idea that we're dosing people in the couple study who do not have a diagnosis. So that's our first evidence that it can be used. I mean, it's being used in the context of someone else close to them having a diagnosis, but that we're building a slow, hopeful evidence base that that could be the case. So my hope is absolutely that that could be the possibility in the future. Um, we should uh, think about that uh, quite a bit of the so-called drug users are um, part of a more uh, problematic or some people would even say pathologic segment of society, so where pathology is more uh, there, and it means these people are more endangered by these things than the usual healthy persons would be. And so I would wish for that some people are able to make these experiences and be not from the subversive part of society, so to say. And I think that could be a great thing if we would have centers where people can expand consciousness in a more systematic fashion. It was always a wish in the 1960s when the people were quite enthusiastic, but also quite open about these possibilities of these substances. And uh, I hope for that but uh, we uh, still have to wait what the studies will show also in respect to potential dangers. Yeah. If Eric doesn't want to comment on this, maybe... It's not yeah. that I d don't want to, but uh, this, is, this is just a big question. Uh, no, I... Um, um, yeah, the last word, right? I don't have a, a last word. Is, um, <laughs> is will it be, uh, as I wake up, I, I think, uh, no, you, you, if necessary, there, it needs to be available, uh, sort of, um, I don't have a last word, it's, it's um, no, it's like we're talking, like when, you, when, you, when, when I put that up on, on medical marijuana, is medical marijuana or marijuana in cannabis, has it been part of, of the normal world? In a way, yes. People cut the edges of the day by taking a mar marijuana instead of a beer. So that's pretty normal, right? It's not, it's not abnormal or so. So it, it, is that the same with, with psilocybin and MDMA? I think that there, there is going to be a, a separate celebrational, probably, category for that. And it's not means where you take every day or so your, your MDMA. So there, there is, and then Probably, I'm in the medical domain, so medicalization of the MDMA-assisted psychotherapy that would be more at my heart, but, uh, but yes, there will be probably opportunities where you have more celebrationally um, settings where you can take uh, drugs and, 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 and psychedelics. Yeah, um, so um, it came up to my mind right now that um, there, there was an uh, ethnographic or cultural anthropology study looking at all the um, um, populations on Earth, how they developed rituals to use altered states of consciousness in their culture. And it is obvious that every culture has done that. There are cultures which have done it not as much, but usually they have done it quite a bit. And uh, 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 I think it was Slotkin, an anthropologist, who has shown that when the people were coming from Siberia to the Americas, they have used every plant around, especially these consciousness altering plants. And Rick Doblin came up with the saying, we are a cultural anomaly. 
in the Western industrialized countries because we haven't developed these kind of rituals, not on an official above ground basis, just in these underground subversive settings. And so uh, I hope very much that we will lose this uh, being this anomaly. <laughs> So time is running out, it would be once again so, so uh, lovely to be able to spend more time around this question. Some of these questions we will be asking, uh, we are doing interviews with all our speakers tomorrow, and uh, some of those questions that we didn't have time to ask today, we will be asking then, and uh, for the rest you just uh, have to keep coming back for our future seminars. Yeah, thanks to the moderator, he was fantastic I think, pretty intelligent and very well. And thanks to you, you are a very attentive audience. Thanks you for that. Um, just some final words. I think we have uh, raised more new questions that, than we have answered today. And this is uh, pretty much the point, to ask good questions and uh, not settle for easy answers. Um, Let's keep on asking especially the, the difficult questions because they are the ones that enable us to, to do this more sustainably, not settle for the easy ones that uh, let us, um, how do you say, out of the loop too easily. Thank you very much for the team of ours. Uh, you've been amazing working, working on this and uh, thank you very much for the, for the audience for being here and of course our amazing speakers.